The Midwest was formed by explorers, those who were willing to risk everything to see a better future. While our lands are still rich with agriculture, we are more than just flyover country. Our former cow towns are now business hubs and technology innovators. On this show, we tell the stories of folks marketing in the middle. This is the Midwest Marketing Show. Welcome to the Midwest Marketing Show. I'm your host, Jeff Julian, and today um, I'm excited because we have another podcaster on the show. We have Mark <laughs> Tennant from A Slice a Day Podcast. Mark, how are you doing? Hey, Jeff. Good, buddy. How are you doing? Good. Great to be on. Thanks so much for asking. Oh, yeah. No problem. Well, I was recently on your podcast, and I was super excited to be interviewed um, from this side of the table. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I wanted to bring you on this show because I thought you had a great format. But before we get started, um, you have a unique story like me about kind of how you got into marketing. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in marketing? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm from Northeast Ohio. Been here pretty much my whole life. I had a, a eight year stint in Korea and Greece when I was in the Air Force, but otherwise kind of been around here. Old radio guy uh, back in the 70s. Um, I was the first high school student at one of the local university, Cleveland State University. They have a radio show on their student radio station. And, you know, the marketing thing kind of happened because you had to promote yourself, right? I mean, you had to start, you know, had to have somebody. We actually broadcasted to the cafeteria there. Now they, nice. they're, they're obviously on the FM dial and have been for a long time, but this was back in 1974. And so, you know, as a high school junior, I had to go kind of market myself then. And then I kind of got into radio a little bit more after high school and so forth and was working at one of the big rockers here in Cleveland, uh, doing overnights, fill-ins, that kind of thing, a lot of interning, and then kind of learning the ropes from some of the larger um, personalities here in Cleveland. Um, kind of fast forward um, a few years uh, after I got out of the service, worked in radio here in Cleveland for a long time, did a lot of sports. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to cover the Cleveland Browns for a few years, so I got the rub elbows with some of the bigger names here in Cleveland and kind of learned different things through different people at different times, through different organizations and so forth. Um, in the 90s, I had a NASCAR business where my partners and I, we were the very, very first folks, and we were the very first folks. We were called LiveRacing.com. And in 1995, we were webcasting, web streaming through Microsoft's net show at the time, the in-car audio of the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. We were the first ones to do that and really had to learn to market there. And that was kind of my first um, dive into the digital side. And uh, back then, word of mouth, it is huge today, but I mean, back then, word of mouth was everything. And really, um, you know, that's kind of by the 1996 Daytona 500, just through word of mouth alone, um, right before Green Flag, we were getting hit at 400 times a second, took out a server, had to buy more bandwidth. So, So so the, the marketing thing kind of worked really early on then for me, and then I've been, I guess, struggling ever since. So there you go. <laughs> I love that you had a radio background. You could tell that you're, you've worked on your voice for, for years um, because yeah. it just comes out very clean. Thanks. Yeah. So um, currently you're doing kind of a mixture of IT and marketing, correct? Yeah. Um, you know, I have a full-time job. When when I hit 40, and about 18 years ago, um, I thought I had to get a real job. So my father was uh, in computers. Actually, my father worked for IBM in the 1950s. I mean, he actually was working in computers. Even in the 60s when I was growing up, I used to play tic-tac-toe with an IBM 360. So I was just, you know, the tech thing. My dad was always into tech and gadgets and that kind of thing. So I just thought IT kind of was a – and at the time, you know, late 90s, mid, mid to late 90s, it was a great time to get into IT. Got into the network working thing and then um you know, started working around Cleveland, worked at Progressive Insurance for a long time. Great company to work for, by the way, and uh, ended up here at Case Western Reserve University. Um, also, magnificent place to work. And what I do here, I work at the medical school and I do IT support, software support, software development, some web stuff. So all of this kind of culminated in, um, you know, with the radio and everything I've had over, um, you know, my history. It all kind of came together once I had my IT background. And as you know, being a marketer, you have to be so diversified with everything we do and it's just really really helped me a lot so that's that's you know kind of how I juggle the two things but uh, yeah it's tough you know full-time job and the other full-time job is the podcast and marketing with Edwards Communications so it's it's a full life but it's fun yeah it's fun. you wouldn't want to waste a minute would you yeah well I, I don't have time yeah exactly <laughs> so I mean I love when you see these uh, these diverse backgrounds you know of different career paths that you come come through and then it all comes together at this nice crescendo of you know taking the radio background and the IT background and 
you know, the marketing of, you know, the radio and it all comes together and works well with the medium that we're delivering on today. Yeah. So it's, it's, we've come a long way. Yeah, exactly. So uh, your podcast, The Slice of the Day, um, it's very unique because most most shows are like ours where it's a, an interview show or there's uh, one person, you know, on the mic only and then kind of like a banter show. But you have right. a, a content curation show. Um, Great. So, and you're delivering content that's usually in article form with the author in an interview. And I, I absolutely think it's an amazing format. And it oh, just thanks, puts, puts that content curation um, blog post kind of on its head. So can you tell us a little bit of the story of how you came up with the idea and, and got started? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, we said kind of in the in the pre um, talk we had. I, I'm. I know I work a lot of hours. Lazy person, and um, I wanted to do something with podcasting because of my radio background, and I obviously wanted to do something in marketing, content marketing specifically. Um, but but I, you know, be, between the the different shows that were out there, there were so many good shows out there, and still remain so many good shows that it was just you know kind of hard to maybe say, can, can I get a guest? Can I keep people engaged for 20, 30 minutes? And then I thought to myself, well, um, you know, there's got to be a better way. So I think this was in November last year. Um, I was listening to Mike Stelzner's um, Social Media Examiner podcast, and he had Guy Kawasaki on, and Guy was talking about, and the whole thing was on using curated content and putting your own little spin on it and using it as your content, not stealing content, yeah. you know, obviously giving credit to the people, but, but, you know, finding some good stuff that you could share with other people um, and being able to take advantage of, you know, the person who created it where they love when you share their content. And we all love when people share our content. And I thought if I could do something that's, and I hate the word snackable, but I'm going to say it. Okay, snackable. Yeah. You know, smaller. I don't try, try, I try very, very hard to stand under eight minutes for every single one. So I thought maybe because I was curating content anyway, I was kind of gathering a Twitter audience and I was reading all kinds of stuff every single day anyway. And I thought after listening to the pod, actually while I was listening to the podcast, you had that moment and it was almost like, oh crap, I can do this. You know, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I could talk to people, I could edit them, I put things into cuts, and I can just write a story based on an article or a piece of content I'm featuring, and then bring on that person, and then, you know, rather than have people just listen to me, listen to the person that created it. So I just kind of thought it all was a pretty good idea, and we've been working on it, we've been doing it since... Uh, First week of December, um, we've iterated a couple of times, not so drastically, but just kind of how the podcast is set up and so forth. The basic format's the same. Again, we try not to stay over, uh, go over uh, eight minutes on it, um, and we just try to keep it interesting. And it's a it's it's a constant struggle out there, but um, you know, they, that's part of the job. That's what we signed up for. That's really is really how it all kind of started and how how it all began. Yeah, I mean, prospecting for a podcast is definitely one of the most difficult things. And I find that having that, that premium LinkedIn account so I can go search for people in Sales Navigator, look for interesting roles and in companies, mm -hmm. um, it definitely is. It pays for the 49 or whatever it is a month. Yeah. You know, the just the curation part of it alone um, is it, really an art. In it, in of itself, and it's something I always try to get better at, try to be more efficient at, and so forth. So, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. So, one of the questions I have is, how effective are you finding podcasts as a delivery vehicle for that content curation? Um, and so, maybe other people, other industries, right? Because I don't want you know, you don't want any competition, right? You want let other industries <laughs> do this, you know. So, like maybe tech, right? There's tons of articles in tech, but no, you know, there's not necessarily that that, you know, evening news format um, for mm -hmm. curating all that content? Um, so, you know, I, I, I use various tools to do that. And you're right. You know, I, I when they say that, you know, who's your audience, you, it can't be everybody. And we don't try to be everybody. So I guess I try my, my audience would be, you know, business owners and marketers, which might even be still too broad. And we might even still have to pivot and kind of refocus our niche a little bit. Um, but it's, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's been successful. Um, but what I essentially do um, is, you know, I use various tools to create the, uh, to curate the content. Um, there's a guy by the name of Neil Furry. I don't know if you know who Neil is. Neil's out on the West Coast. Hey, Neil. Um, good, good dude. And he has a website, furrymoney.com. And Neil's always writing some great 
and this is another thing I wish I could do is write. I guess that's why I podcast because yeah. I can't write. You've got the radio um, voice. <laughs> so, so what Neil came up with, um, he said, Hey, I, I think I might've come up with a, re- a curated system you might be able to use. And he put a blog post out there. He put a video and essentially I use uh, scoop it, buzz sumo snipply. Uh, I use right relevance now too. shout out to the right relevance folks. They have a great platform. And, uh, what I do is I, I, I take Scoop It articles, maybe add my little bit of a, if nobody knows what Scoop It is, essentially it's a curation um, platform. Uh, Guillaume de Cugis and the folks out there um, do a really, really good job. And essentially what you do is you, you know, they, they cre- curate a lot of content for it based on your niche. You add your little um, comments to it, your unique spin on things, and then you can distribute it out through the different social channels to your community and so forth. So we use Scoop It. We use BuzzSumo. If folks don't know what BuzzSumo is, Neil Patel's uh, platform, great platform just just go to buzzsumo.com there's tons of tutorials out there great place to find content and even content ideas and curation of content and um so so you know really i i I hope i answered your question essentially that's pretty much how we do things and we're kind of always um you know trying to get better and get more efficient at this content curation thing but it's worked well for me and i think that um for me again because i said i'm basically lazy to come up with a topic or to come up with a certain guest and something for once a week and to come up with a show like that, that's a little more tough for me, I think, than, this, than what I do every day to just find people who have already created the content for me. And all I have to do is get a hold of them, have them agree to come on, and then I do my thing from there. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I I, I love that you're just you're taking on podcasting. And like you said, you're not necessarily an author. And, and I've been blogging for years, but only in the past maybe couple of years I've really started to – to dig into what it means to write a good post. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, you're, you embrace what you have and you're, you're giving back um, to the community and, and you're, you're providing value. You're not, you know, focusing on yourself or focusing on, you know, the companies that you work for, you're focusing on delivering great content. So it's, well, yeah, that's what we try to do. That's what we try to do. Awesome. So on the show, we have a section called the threes and um, you read a lot of bad articles, I'm sure. And you lead a <laughs> <laughs> Read yeah. a lot of great ones too. Um, so for the threes, if, if you're a content author, um, what are what are some of those mistakes that you see people doing, and how can they kind of get past them? Um, you, you know, I'm not sure I'm that big of a judge to see what people are doing right and doing wrong. But in my opinion, as I read things, probably one of the biggest things I see is people not putting enough time needed into a article um, to create something that stands out that's like unique you know, for the creator. Um, so, you know, for example, if you see a, you know, one of the how to or top 10 ways to do this or that, you know, I like them when they're good. I really do. But a lot of times it just seems like people use those types of things as filler. They try to put a good title on it for clickbait or whatever the term is. And so people hopefully click on it and they're looking for eyeballs and that kind of thing. But, you know, that that's probably the one thing, um, you know, I'm going to say I'm guilty of this. Probably another mistake, I think people they quit too soon. And I think the reason they quit too soon is not being patient enough and, and waiting to develop that audience, right? I mean, you, you know, it, it, it gets your crickets all the time. You're working your tail off. You're just not seeing the fruits of your labor, as they say. You know, hang in there because I'm the most impatient person in the world. I think I've got – I think I had ADD before it was even invented. You know what nice. I mean? Uh, you know, <laughs> you always – you know, you're always – kind of in the now, but just hang in there. And I got to tell you, at about the six-month mark here for the podcast, and I kind of was getting a little discouraged, but you just kept on doing what you had to do. Uh, that's really when I started seeing it. And like, Don't they say six to nine months? And at the, about, right about almost at the six-month mark, um, a few weeks back, we I really had a big bump in traffic. We had Doug Kessler on from Velocity Partners in the UK. Doug's a great guest. He's got a lot of really good followers. He promoted a heck out of it for me. But he did a very, very good job um, in this podcast. It, it, it seemed like it was a very, very good podcast, and it really did well for us. So I got to tell you, just – keep you know hang in there hang in there hang in there and i know this is probably stuff and i'm not really saying anything earth shattering to folks but just from personal experience hang in there and and finally i think the one thing is people not taking enough time for continuing education in the art and it is an art of content marketing uh it's constantly changing and i think even as we said in the pre-show maybe we even said it during the podcast here you know to do what we do you know you have to be tech savvy somewhat you've got to be a writer you've got to be a creator you have to be an advisor and to do all this you've got to con- you've got to learn it's it's a constant learn and it's fun it's really really fun to learn i mean i I love when I hear a podcast or I listen to somebody say an example of how they do something and you go, 
oh my God, why didn't I think of that? You know, so yeah. it's it, it's the continuing education thing. So I think for me, those are the three things, not putting enough time, people not being patient, and then um, not taking enough time for continuing education probably. Those are those are perfect. And I see those exact um, tips, you know, whenever I look at content and you're just like, you see the short post, you're like, wow, you nailed that headline. You got me here. You could have provided so much value and earned a fan, but you yeah. just you know, came short with your, you know, 800 word blog posts that just didn't have enough meat. <laughs> and you know what, I will say this, as far as words go, and again, I'm not a writer or a blogger or anything like that. I, you know, I, I read enough of them, but not that great at it. But, um, you know, those little articles sometimes, again, for an ADD guy like me, I like to get in, get out. If it's good, I don't care if it's 200 or 300 words. If I get something out of it, I'm okay with that. So, oh, absolutely. Per personal opinion. Yeah. I, I, when I think of word count, the shorter it is, the harder it is to write. And you should, you know, if you're going to go for like an 800 word blog post, you need to write 2000 words and then yeah. chop out 1200. Uh, I've heard that. I've heard, I've actually heard that. Yeah. But um, my, my brother's a writer real quick. My brother, Scott, he's a VP of communications for Vitamix. Oh, in nice. The, in Cleveland. And boy, can my brother write. And it's almost like, that's eh, the postman's kid. That's the, you know, I mean, I, we're not really related. We might have the same mom, but no, my brother is very, very good at writing. And I just wish I had his gift, but I don't know. Maybe this is what God gave me. <laughs> yeah. And I love their products too. So I'd love to give them a Great. shout out. Great. So as we start to wrap this up, um, who are some of the people who influence you in, in the Midwest region and then also worldwide? Oh, uh, Midwest region. Well, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I listed some folks and, um, a lot of it has to do with entertainment just because of the way they've done things. I, I never met the guy, but I have to say, you know, Jimmy Buffett, huge fan. And I've just liked the way he has, you know, he does what he does. He, you know, quintessential content marketer. He, you know, has the music. That was his niche. Right. Um, and the way, you know, the island themes and so forth. He built that audience up and then he just took that audience and just has monetized it, you know, so many times over and over again. But the Margaritaville cafes, the clothing line, the foods, the liquor, the beer, he's just done a great job with it. And I kind of admire him for that. And I kind of love to see what he's doing. Plus, I, I'm a I'm a parrot head. There you um, go. And then and also the band Blackberry Smoke. They're out of Atlanta, Georgia. Good bunch of guys. Hey, guys, if you happen to be on the bus someday seeing this, um, you know, what they've done is they've essentially just been a band and you know kind of getting their word out there but not oh nine it was they really really started big on uh, content and using social to get their word out and they are they really really have come a long way they've opened for zach brown they've been on zach brown's label they're actually their latest tour is with zz top they'll be coming to a town near you here i'm sure in the next few weeks so i, I really admired how they did it um built that audience you know the, through their music found a way to monetize it love that um, I have to say Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, I think when I first heard a podcast with him, probably 08, 09, I thought, whoa, this dude's got a motor. And I thought I had one. And how can you not appreciate somebody with a motor like that? Even if you don't maybe dig Gary's personality, I happen to. Smart dude, um, hard worker. And, uh, you know, I, I admire that. And then finally, uh, I think here in Northeast Ohio, I will I'll say Joe Polizzi. Um, yeah. Joe's become a really good friend of mine. I've had the advantage of living here in Northeast Ohio. You know, he's a Browns fan. I'm a Browns fan. He's a he's a brokenhearted Cleveland sports fan. I am too. And and he's done me so many favors over the last couple of years. I have no idea, Joe, when I'm going to repay you for any of this stuff. But um, anyway, it's you know he he's been really big as far as regionally goes, and really he's helped me a lot and helped me to learn. And and anytime I need anything, if I just shoot him an email, he's always been so gracious. So I have to give a shout out for him. And then. Uh, I don't know. I guess and then my dad, he's been gone 16 years, but still, you know, think of him a lot. So I guess, you know, dad as well, still still in the back of my mind and kind of kind of, you know, what he taught me over the years and so forth. So I'd, I'd have to say that probably runs the gamut from regional to national to worldwide. <laughs> wow, that's a great mixture of people. I, I, I think you're the first one that came out with two uh, musicians up front. But I like that you see that the marketer in them, you know, and you it, see the spin. And, and funny enough, though, I love musicians, and the only thing I'm, I've been able to play very well is the radio. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on the show, and I can't wait to get this all mixed up and edited. And you're the first uh, guest that we've had on video. So, um, oh, great. Yeah. Hey, hey world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Jeff. Thanks so much, buddy. I appreciate it. Um, we'll talk soon. Sounds good.